Scotty. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Banaz Kibria. I lead Google Cloud's global financial services policy efforts. Um, and it's my great pleasure uh, to be facilitating today's discussion on the topic of building the market foundation for the future, which is an important topic for us to be uh, uh, asking at the, the start of this conference. Um, we have two great uh, perspectives to bring to this question from both an industry and a regulatory perspective. Uh, and to that end, it is uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Phil Moyer and Troy Paredes. Um, just by way of introduction, Troy Paredes is the founder of Paredes Strategies, LLC, where he advises on financial regulation, compliance, risk management, corporate governance, and regulatory strategy. From 2008 to 2013, Troy was a commissioner at the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. Troy was a professor of law at the Washington University in St. Louis before joining the SEC. He's also been a lecturer on law at Harvard Law School, a distinguished scholar in residence at NYU School of Law, and a distinguished policy fellow and lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Troy is the author of numerous academic articles and a co-author of a treatise entitled Securities Regulation and also co-hosts a podcast on fintech called Appetite for Disruption. Um, Phil, Phil Moyer is Vice President of uh, Strategic Industries at Google Cloud. Phil and his team manage the relationships with Google's largest enterprise customers as they leverage Google Cloud to innovate within their industries across a host of uh, different industries, including financial services. Prior to Google, Phil was director of financial services at Amazon Web Services, where he managed banking, capital markets, insurance, and payments. He previously managed a venture capital portfolio in fintech, health tech, and martech at Safeguard Scientific. He was CEO of two financial, financial technology companies, Edgar Online and Cassiopeia. And he spent 15 years at Microsoft where he managed global customer teams, industry teams, and services organizations. Thank you both for joining us and sharing your views. Um, thank you also to FIA for hosting this fantastic conference. I've got to say it's really great to be back in person, uh, finally. Um, to turn to the questions today, I think uh, it's long been said that financial markets are the first to adopt new technologies, and that's certainly been true of the derivatives markets, which were early adopters of electronic trading. Before we turn to the main subject of today's discussion, which is markets of the future, though, it might make sense to do a little bit of stock taking um, and to ask the question where you think uh, the market and market participants are right now in terms of technology adoption. Phil, could you start? Sure, absolutely. I would say that um, you know, similar to technologies, um, the financial markets are a big adopter of cloud technologies and some of the latest technologies that we're seeing in machine learning. Um, in particular, you know, recently there was a, a study done by Green, Greenwich Coalition that showed that the trading venues, exchanges, and data providers, over 93% of those organizations are, are in some way, shape, or form providing services on the cloud. And so we're seeing the actual venues, um, I would say venues, as well as the data providers that really provide the, the backbone of the industry already doing things with cloud. The participants as well, you know, we're seeing really significant um, activity in the participants. And we're, we estimate, along with the Greenwich Coalition and some other studies that we've done, about 71% of the financial industry, so that's buy side and, and sell side, are doing work already with the cloud. And a lot of that is because you're able to do a lot of experimentation, you're doing, able to, to stand up and tear down research rapidly, you're able to use the latest innovations in machine learning, you're able to do it in a much more secure way that you're able to do it on-prem, on and in a lot of ways you're able to handle data sets that you've never been able to handle you know, on-prem as effectively as you can in the cloud. And so we're seeing really wide-scale adoption of cloud technologies. Troy, what is your perspective on that question from a regulatory standpoint? Look, to take a step back for, for a second, I think to I think underscore what, what Phil was saying in your question in terms of the early adoption of technology when it comes to financial markets, at the risk of potentially oversimplifying, but you think about some of the basic cornerstones of financial markets, one is information and decision making based on information, and the other is risk and risk management. And so if you just take those two basic cornerstones and think about the ways in which technological innovation over time has allowed for access to better data and therefore better decision-making on the whole, 
that's the expectation, as well as uh, leveraging technology when it comes to how you manage, how you manage risk. So I think for, given, the, given the importance of those two elements to our financial markets and to financial institutions, I think you would expect to see exactly what Phil was saying and what the history has been, which is to say financial market participants of a whole uh, host of types asking themselves, how do we take advantage of this technology for those purposes? And if you're an early adopter, I presume you'd like to get a bit of a competitive advantage out of it uh, as well. From the, from the regulatory uh, side, look, I think any time there is technological change, regulators are going to ask the question, well, what does that mean in terms of the ways in which our regulatory objectives are implicated and the ways in which our regulatory objectives will or won't be met in light of the new technology? And that can take time to figure out, quite frankly. Uh, we'll talk, I'm sure, more uh, about this in terms of, well, how do you figure that out? Because it is, such an important, it is such an important piece of it. But even as the regulators think about what the implications are in terms of regulatory regimes, regulatory requirements, regulatory imperatives, uh, if you will, I think it's also the case that regulators have the recognition that the technological change might not only be good for the marketplace and all the market participants, but that as you come to better understand it, they actually allow the regulatory objectives to be more effectively met. Now, there may need to be some accommodations and adaptation along the way for it all to align and sync up, but I think there are real opportunities there, and from a policy perspective, seeing that there are real opportunities for the market to have benefits that it enjoys, but also for the regulators in terms of their goals and objectives, protecting the marketplace, integrity, transparency, and the like to be served to. That's a great answer. I want you to hold on to some of those thoughts for when we turn to this next question, which is sort of um, future looking. Uh, you know, um, Phil, coming back to you for a second, a uh, recent article in Waters Technology talked about the prospects of exchanges moving to cloud, and that's been you know, in the news a, a fair bit. But what they said is that it's going to be a crawl, walk, run situation with some low hanging fruits to be plucked in the short term and then some more paradigmatic changes over the medium to long term. As you think about future state, do you, first of all, agree with that sort of, you know, that sense that there's going to be time, various time horizons? And if so, what do you see occurring during each of those um, time horizons? Sure. So I would absolutely agree with that 100%. You know, the crawl phase, we call it the crawl phase, but there's really some foundational things that occur in that phase. The very first phase, most organizations are moving data to the cloud. They're generally doing, um, I'll say, kind of at the edge work. They'll take some, maybe some of their, their um, a handful of their systems. It might be an HR system, you know, it might be an analytics system. But we are generally seeing organizations move data um, in, that, in that phase and, and really a little bit of analytics. In the second phase is where we really see a lot of innovation happening. So when I start thinking about, you know, in the exchanges market, um, it's settlement, it's clearing, it's risk management, it's collateral management, um, even, you know, compliance and, and a handful of, like, really, um, you know, new products. Um, we really start seeing organizations leverage that innovation in the cloud. The third is where we're really seeing the organizations start to move the, the latency-sensitive um, markets to the cloud. In each one of those phases, while we call it crawl in the very first phase, I, I would tell you it's maybe one of the most important phases. You know, Troy's point is that, you know, you have the opportunity to get more increased levels of transparency and increased levels of, I'll say, risk management in that phase. And so much that happens um, in that phase, you know, when you, when you move to the cloud, infrastructure becomes code, operations becomes code, security becomes code, compliance becomes code. You know, a whole variety of things become code that was not code before, where you were trusting kind of people, processes, and a little bit of technology. Now you're actually able to codify a lot of that actually into the core infrastructure that runs your applications. And so when you're launching, you can have compliance built into the applications. You can have security built into the applications. You can have even, you know, processes inside of procurement. And so organizations have to actually do an actual uh, organizational change as part of that. So that early phase is really important. It changes the actual operating model of the organization and, and the skill sets um, of the individuals. And so as you start to move into these latter phases where you want to launch new products, it's so much easier to start launching new products because you've got a cloud-based, agile first model that you're able to move to. By the time you get to latency-sensitive applications or the latency-sensitive you know, elements of the exchanges, you're already in that cloud, that cloud operating model. And so you're able to really like, bring the kind of compliance that you need you know, in, in a more automated you know, fashion you know, to be able to meet the challenges that you need in that next generation. So those three phases are absolutely ringing true, and we're seeing organizations really do, you know, all three of those. They're starting all three simultaneously, okay. um, but absolutely. 
Um, Troy, uh, again, putting uh, your, your hat back on as a former SEC commissioner, you've always had your finger on the pulse of, when it, you know, of, of uh, technological innovation and change. What are, as you're hearing um, Phil talk a little bit about these various phases going into the future, what, um, how are regulators and policymakers thinking about um, this? What are the sorts of things that are getting the regulatory community excited and what are the things that are causing concern? Yeah, I want to pick up um, and answer that on, on something Phil said, and I think underscore the impact, which is in, in so many instances, just given the state of technology uh, up to this point, you'd have, let's just call it your transaction, and then you say, all right, now what's the compliance overlay you put on top of it? Now, that could be technology-based, it could be policies and procedures or the policies-based, but, but it's, it's as if there was the transaction side of things and then the compliance side of things. The, the point Phil made, I, I think, is really important, which is to say the, the increasing ability to, to integrate all of that is incredibly powerful. And it's not to say it's easy, but it's incredibly, it's incredibly powerful to have compliance built into the transaction in the way that I think um, Phil was getting at. That comes back to the promise from a compliance side. It also comes back to, look, it's not just that from a compliance perspective, are things better off when there's more integrity when you root out misconduct? It's good for the markets as a whole. And it's good for market participants as well. So again, you have another one of those win-win uh, opportunities that technology is allowing us. Using that, though, to come back to, to the question, from a, I guess my former vantage uh, point uh, as a commissioner at the SEC, one of the things I would be particularly focused on is wanting to make sure I had, and, and, and the folks at the agency and other parts of government, had the proper understanding of the technology itself. Right? So that with, that with that understanding of the technology, you can then figure out not only one, what really is the promise, and the, and, and the promise beyond aspirations, the promise in terms of how does it translate into real world on the ground improvements when it comes to regulatory interests and objectives. Part of that is technology clearly and understanding the technology with that kind of granularity and technical know-how, um, if you will. The other piece of that is then the following. If I'm sitting back and saying, all right, I understand the power of the technology. We have the, the folks who understand the technical aspects of the technology, and the agencies are making really significant strides from that vantage point, which is terrific. Then the question becomes, all right, what do I need to do in terms of the regulatory requirements so that all of that lines up? So you have, it's another version of, I guess, crawl, walk, run, but from the, from the regulatory lens on it. There's a lot of things you need to understand to then be able to bring it all together with enough granularity, enough particularity, so that you're comfortable from a policymaking position to make the kinds of changes to the regulatory regime that you won't find yourself two, three, four, five years down the road saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe we did that. Rather, you're gonna say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we did that. But there's a lot that you gotta work through to get yourself to that point. I'd like to stay actually in this, on this topic of future state. Um, one of the things we do when we talk about future state um, and technology is look a lot at the industry and not so much at the regulator. We look at the regulator as a regulator and not as a consumer of the technology. Turning a little bit to this question of, of, of a regulator's own use of technology and the, the sort of the focus on subtech and reg tech that, that you see a lot uh, of these days, much of this is predicated on this vision of sort of um, real-time regulatory reporting. Is that a likely medium to long-term um, eventuality? And, and what other sorts of things do you see happening in this space? And, and Troy, maybe I'll start with you and then Phil turn to you next. I'm always hesitant to put time frames on things because there's so many contingencies uh, that, that drive that. Um, so having given myself a little bit of an out on, on time frame, what I would say is we've seen over the last handful of years uh, regulators across the financial regulatory landscape touting, and I think to their credit, when they've used more advanced analytics in order to ferret out something that otherwise perhaps might not have been ferreted out. And I think that's part and parcel of exactly what you're, what you're talking about. I expect to see that continue. I expect to see that continue, one, because it helps the regulators better meet and more efficiently and effectively meet their objectives. But number two, given the pace of technolo technological change in the marketplace, the regulators increasingly need to be able to match that with their own capability from a technological perspective so that they can get 
the most out of, for sure, but so that they are able to effectively monitor and meet the expectations that they've set for themselves and, quite frankly, that others, that others have, um, have for them. So I think the trend line, the trajectory, is going to uh, persist. The slope of the, <laughs> of the line uh, and the rate of change is difficult, uh, is difficult to say, but I do think it's, it's something that regulators are focused on. It's something that I would certainly be focused on uh, if I were still there for all the reasons that uh, that were um, that we're talking about. You know, Bill Gates said you overestimate what you can do in one year and underestimate what you can do in a decade. So I always pick like five and a half years when somebody asks me for time frame to, for to go with that transformation. <laughs> so um, no, I, I I would say that you know there's a couple things from a regulatory perspective. You know, first of all, I think the regulators, the regulators I've seen are very very engaged you know, in the migration to the cloud. I would also say they're extremely engaged in the movement to machine learning. Um, and even, you know, I think that we're seeing some really fantastic work that's being done already as it relates to kind of the next set of asset classes that may or may not, you know, be, a, be traded on exchanges. From a machine learning perspective, I mean, I'm a really big believer that machine learning, um, there's a tsunami of asset classes that are hitting investors right now. And there's more choices for risk and how you manage risk and how you get exposure to the risk that you're interested in um, than ever before. And it's only going to increase. You know, the CMA, you know, and its move to the cloud was a lot about accessibility and giving even a wider access to both asset classes and also investors all over the world. And so when I see that tsunami coming, you know, of asset classes, of investors, um, and the variety of risk combinations that can be done, and, and all the work that has to be done to keep the market safe the way we have to date, machine learning is at the core of it. And um, Andrew Moore, our head of, of machine learning, um, talks about the fact that in 2030, um, machine learning is really going to be doing th three things for us. It's going to be giving us meaning, it's going to be providing us concierge services, and it's going to be a guardian. And today, to kind of give you a little bit of a, a peek over the horizon, if you go onto Google today and you, you Google what are the cash and cash equivalents of Apple, you get an answer. Now think about how hard it is to be able to get that, that answer. You can also pick a small cap company and say what are the cash and cash equivalents you know, of a particular company. But the ability to be able to extract information that are critical to be able to make, a, a, to make an investor decision is really, really important. In the concierge area, I would tell you as well, go into Google and also say, what was the worst performing stock yesterday? And you'll actually get an answer to that. I think that you'll see machine learning starting to pick up the outliers more rapidly and, and to be able to pick up outliers both in trading, um, in anti-money laundering, you know, and even in, in activity as it relates to you know, the functioning of the market. So I think that you'll see a, a lot more you know, work being done for the regulators, almost like a concierge presenting to the, to the regulators a dashboard of risks that they should be evaluating. And then from a guardian perspective, you know, I think that there's a whole variety of risks, whether or not it's cybersecurity risks, whether or not it's, you know, um, you know, nation state actors, or whether or not it's like, you know, moving money in the wrong way through the markets. And I think that you're going to see as well, um, machine learning is becoming a lot more accessible. The tools of the large vendors that are out there, the cloud vendors, are really dropping the barrier to be able to use machine learning. And so, you know, what I, I really view what's going to be happening from a regulatory perspective in those three contexts of that, that's how the cloud vendors will be supporting um, regulators. And I think that's how, you know, the regulators will be using the technology to protect us. If I can just pick up on the, on the machine learning point, which is we're at a point now, and it applies to the marketplace, but it applies to regulators uh, as well, where there's more data than ever. But it's not just that. It's the increased ability to process it. If, if all you had was the increased ability to process it, if you didn't have as much data, well, that would be good, but not as good. If you had more data, as much we have now, being able to process it, I'm not sure how much. Right? So it is that, it is that combination of that, of that one, too which all then yields itself, one hopes and expects, into better decision making across a whole host of fronts. And market participants are focused on better decision making, but to uh, Phil's point, regulators, policymakers are focused on that as well. And as part of any surveillance effort of whatever type, one of the real challenges is always false positives, but also false negatives. And if you think about the power of machine learning in terms of using those capabilities to make better decisions than would otherwise be made, nothing's going to be perfect. It's always going to be a set of choices and trade-offs. One other second order effect of all of that that I think is really important is, is, is it can free up individuals to do other things. Right? The, the advances in technology do not take individuals out of the equation. 
it may allow those individuals to bring their expertise to bear in different ways. And then you have a really another powerful one-two punch where you're leveraging technology, machine learning and otherwise, and you can ask, how do we use our teams in other ways to achieve the objectives or maybe, maybe use them to do other things than what you had them doing at that particular moment in time? So I think there's a, an incredible amount of a promise there. And again, it's not just in the marketplace, but thinking about the ways in which regulators can leverage that for themselves and meeting, meeting their obligations. It's such a good point, Troy. I mean, I have to tell you is that, you know, it's been said locks keep only good people out. And it's generally, you know, there's so many rote tasks that we do inside of the financial industry you know, that are just trying to avoid, you know, um, missteps that, that bad actors uh, wanted to do. And I think digitization of the markets, digitization of assets, digitization of the rails themselves, you know, if we think about faxes that still move around for settlement, you know, in some cases margin, you know, margin calls and so forth. It is getting those things digitized are actually going to allow basically the regulatory regime to be a part of the fabric as opposed to being the gate um, to really getting functioning markets working, you know, fast. Well, you both have laid out a very compelling vision of the future, and I, and I think I'd like to ask one last question, which is sort of getting to the meat of the topic, which is, what is the foundation we need to lay for that future? And, and um, Troy, maybe if I can start with you. Um, you know, we've uh, heard a lot about cybersecurity and operational resilience, and in fact, over the last month, we've seen um, Chairman Gensler put out a number of rulemakings in this space. What, how do you? How are you thinking about those things? Uh, and you know, what should we be expecting from a regulatory perspective in order to sort of create that foundation for us for that future? A couple of uh, thoughts. One, we should expect a continued focus on all the things you just mentioned in terms of operational resiliency, in terms of security, in terms of in terms of privacy. Uh, uh, market participants demand that. Um, but in addition, the regulators demand it as well. And as you made reference, the SEC has put forward um, some regulatory initiatives uh, that will continue to move forward. And again, this will be a front and center topic across uh, the regulatory landscape, financial services, uh, and, and otherwise. And I think people would agree for, for good reason. I think when you get past that, and you get to some of the other points we're talking about, there's another aspect of out of his laying the foundation or building on the foundation that's been, that's been laid. And that is really thinking about and, and, and the, the nitty gritty aspects of, all right, we have this technological change, whether we're talking about blockchain, we're talking about cloud, we're talking about machine learning, we're talking about whatever happens to come next and what happens to come, comes next after that. And asking the questions, well, what, what are the benefits that that technology promises in, in real concrete, tangible ways? What are the benefits that that technology um, uh, offers? There's certainly a lot of regulatory scrutiny on the risks and concerns that that technology could give rise to. And that's fair and appropriate, and you would expect that, and in fact, and in fact want that. But I think what's important is to, is to make sure that we don't find ourselves in having to pick one outcome or the other. That we avoid any sort of a sense of, of, of either or. And in some sense, I think that's been a subtext to what Phil and I have been chatting about, which is, which is the technological change can be good for the markets, but can also be good for the regulators in terms of more effectively meeting and, and more efficiently meeting their regulatory objectives. So then you get to what is a bit of the, uh, of the challenge here, which is when deploying technology in our markets, you then face the question of, all right, how does it fit with the current interpretation and understanding of particular regulatory requirements. And needing to work that through because you can often meet the regulatory goal, no fraud, no manipulation, transparency, market integrity, but the specific rules that were designed with different technology in mind don't always fit so well. And so needing to figure out at the very detailed granular level the kinds of changes that need to be made to rules, regulations, perhaps statutes, interpretations, guidance, no action letters, executive orders, all that sort of stuff that makes the totality of the regulatory regime so it fits for the technology with an eye on the benefits the technology promises, both for the marketplace as well as in terms of advancing regulatory goals. And Phil, I mean, this, this is a topic I'm, I know you must be talking to customers about. How, how are you working through uh, these kinds of issues with, with customers? Yeah, I think there's, there's two things. One, first and foremost, you know, as a, as a technology provider to the markets, our, our job, one, is security. 
And so we have this notion of secured, uh, I'm sorry, of shared fate, not just shared responsibility, your responsibility, my responsibility, but actually shared fate. Um, and so as a technology provider, you know, we're very, um, very much focused on this idea of how do we really make our infrastructure your infrastructure? How do we give you the transparency you need into the underlying infrastructure? How do you build architectures that are more resilient that you could build on your own? And to be able to stand up exchanges you know, around the world or to be able to, to build DR, pilot light DR sites, or to be able to build air-gapped and time-gapped disaster recovery, you know, protect you from crypto lockers. So job one for us is to be able to build a, an environment where you can do trustless computing you know, at rest, and I'm sorry, security or encryption in motion, encryption at rest, and encryption in process you know, in, a, in a way that where the markets are trust you know, that whatever kind of exchange runs on top of that infrastructure is going to be secure. Second thing I would say um, that we really are focused on is a lot of what Troy had mentioned around information. I actually am a big believer that I think the assets will conform to the, to the regulations as opposed to the regulations. Regulations will conform a little bit to the assets, but I think that there's a really good reason, you know, why we have 166 form types that have been built up over the years. You know, the 30 Act was created for a reason. The very first form type that was created was an S1 in the, third, in the, you know, in the 30 Act. And that was because you wanted to know who you're actually, who's, who's taking money from you, where can I find them, you know, if, they ha if something goes wrong, how much money are they raising, how many shares are they raising, you know, and a little bit about the financials uh, of that company. And I think today in, in a world of crypto and a world of digital assets and everything else, I think some of us would really like to just simply have a, an S1 from time to time. And so I think that what's going to happen is that I think that you know, the regulations are there for a good reason. You know, transparency, liquidity goes to transparency. That's been true throughout time. And so you know, my sense is that um, organizationally, we're spending a lot of time with organizations both about getting the security right and then also really being able to help get that transparency and a whole variety of technologies, machine learning technologies, giving better access to data, and even you know, ideating with organizations on how they can launch these, this next set of assets and the next set of, um, um, I'll say, kind of oracles and transparency agents that'll, that'll help us in the future. Well, I, I think we're almost out of time. We are out of time. I think we, I probably could have asked you to another 30 minutes worth of questions. I don't know if you've got one last concluding thought, but, uh, but I, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining and, uh, and give you each one, uh, uh, one quick concluding thought. Incredible amount of promise <laughs> and, and, and potential challenges to realize it. And I think that the regulators deserve a lot of credit for all the effort and the time and the attention uh, that they're spending. Uh, on it to work uh, to work this through. So uh, a lot of reason, I think, to be optimistic. I would agree as well. I think this is the fastest the regulatory regimes that I've ever seen um, uh, in my career. You know, I've been through a number of generations of regulation, and it's it's actually fantastic to see how how I'll say alert and and engaged the regulatory community is in this. And I would also see the the, techn the technology community. When I get a chance to see a lot of startups. They're not saying, hey, we're gonna disrupt everyone. Instead, what they're saying is that this is the element of the financial industry that needs to be rebuilt for the following reason, to make it more efficient, to make it faster, to make it more transparent. And so we're doing it in a way that's, I'll say, uh, much more familiar and you know, I would say uh, faster than I've ever seen it happen before. So. Well, thank you both very much. Thank all of you for, for the last 30 minutes and, uh, and we'll see you at the other events today.